Father, again, we come into Your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. We come with great thanksgiving for Your love, for Your grace, for the wonderful privilege that You've given us to gather together in this unique format, in this fellowship, to feast upon Your Word. May the Holy Spirit be the only one who teaches us. May He filter out foolishness, ignorance, that which is not the truth of your word, but seal to our hearts that which is the truth, the truth that you want each one of us to know. We long to grow in grace and knowledge of you. May the Lord Jesus Christ be exalted and the Father glorified in the Son. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Welcome to Blessed Hope Forever. We are studying together in 1 Corinthians verse by verse, and in our last study together, we left off around verse 15 of chapter 4. In the uh, 15th verse, we were told that uh, uh, we actually read Paul saying that I have begotten you by means of the gospel. I've pointed out in Every one of these studies, and I'm and I'm of the mind that some people, you know, uh, say that they uh, get tired of, of hearing it, and I apologize for that. But I never get tired of hearing it. This is God's word. This is not Paul's word. It's not Timothy's word or John's word. It's God's word. Now think about that for a moment. We know that God is the creator of heaven and earth, that He spoke the worlds into existence. Uh, we know that whatsoever uh, He willed, whatsoever He pleased, that He did in heaven, uh, in earth, in all deep places. He works in us to will and to do of His good pleasure. We serve and we worship a sovereign God, a God who is supremely sovereign. And this is this is God's Word, okay? And yet, uh, sermons are preached, and uh, commentaries have been written, books have been written, which uh, mention Paul a thousand times more than they mention God. You know, though most Christians, I think, would agree this is God's Word, that's what they do. But because of the way the things are preached, we're often led to believe that this is just merely Paul's word. You know, these are Paul's ideas. And many a sermon has been preached where most of the sermon gives you, you know, background on Paul's life. Paul did not bring these Corinthians to new birth. They were born by the Spirit of God, by the will of God, by the Word of God. They were born above by God. They weren't born by Paul. And it is the Holy Spirit that says He had begotten them. These words are the words of God Almighty. So we come to verse 16. Wherefore, I beseech you, and yeah, I admit this is a letter from Paul the Apostle to uh, the, the church at Corinth, uh, to Timothy. And if, and if that's all it is, if that's all it is, we might as well just go somewhere else and do something else. You know, it's a beautiful letter and we could get some lessons out of it, but then that means that, well, it, it really isn't God's Word. You know, we're looking at the writings of Paul. We're looking at the logic, the reasoning of Paul. And we'll try to get some good lessons out of it. And yet we have the clear statement of God's Word that what, what Paul the Apostle wrote was God's Word. God's message to the Thessalonians was that they received the Word of God, they had received it, and that they received it not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth, the Word of God, we are studying the Word of God, not the Word of Paul. 
Dearly beloved, this book is not like other books that we read. You know, Paul may have held the pen. He did hold the pen, okay? But he's not the author. He did not author this book. So when we read, Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. This is the Holy Spirit, and thousands of sermons have been preached on, on how we need to be followers of Paul. That word wherefore, okay, follows the verse that preceded it, okay? For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Now, what is the word therefore, therefore? Okay, because I brought you to birth. This is the Holy Spirit. I brought, says God, brought you to new birth. I begat you and I beseech you, okay? Think of it. God Almighty is beseeching you. I think we ought to take notice. What does he mean by beseeching? Well, the word beseech there is the word parakaleo, come alongside to comfort, encourage, console. Jesus said in John to his disciples, the Holy Spirit would come, the Comforter would come. Same word, okay? Same word used for the Holy Spirit. Same word. Our Comforter. The Comforter. Okay, same word in the Greek. I begat you, says God, therefore I beseech you, I comfort you, I console you, I encourage you, present tense, I presently comfort you, because you have become, you have become followers of me. Now, I know that is probably not what your translation says. The King, I know it's not what the King James says. But that is how it reads in the original Greek text, okay? Which absolutely, I believe, convey, conveys the thought that, that the Holy Spirit had in mind when He wrote it. Not Paul, but when He wrote it. And he, when He wrote it through Paul. And that is clearly confirmed by the passive voice. It's a passive, you have presently become, okay? The active voice, folks, would say that you, the subject, did the action. The passive voice is the subject was acted upon. Dearly beloved, it's a passive voice. The word become is our word genomai, okay, begat, coming. The word means to come into being, I'm, means I'm born, I become, come about. That's what the word means uh, to happen. My, my King James Version says, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. The original text says, Wherefore, because I, God, begat you through the gospel, I presently come alongside you to console you, comfort you, encourage you. Why? Why? Well, because you have become, not by something you did, followers of me. That is what the text is saying. I know there's a lot of people going to resist that, but that's what the text is saying. It's not asking us to do anything, much less be a follower of Paul. The text is saying, you have become followers of God. You are presently being made followers of God, and that not by something you did. And I figure I'm likely to get in trouble for this one. You're, I'm likely to get criticized by someone for saying that, but folks, that is what the text is saying. I am not a follower of Paul, okay, neither of you, nor of Apollos or Cephas or, or anyone else. We are followers of Christ. And I don't mean to, to sound condescending, okay, but most of the people I meet don't spend much time in this book. It's the greatest thing in the world. It, it isn't a book written by some man. It isn't some ancient now, they, the manuscripts are ancient, that's, that's true, but it isn't an ancient treasure that somebody dug up. We, we find the writings of people, and we put them in a museum, and, we're, you know, and nobody's reading them. But boy, you know, we own that, that precious book, right? I mean, you know, none of that, none of it holds a candle to this book. It's so common that you can actually throw it away and you can go buy another one, you know, fairly easy. At least it still is. It may not be later. But to be fair, most Christians treasure 
this book. They most, most Christians I know treasure the Word of God, but many who, do, who don't spend a lot of time in it. I know many shy away from the grammar, folks, but that's all we have is words and grammar. That's all I have to work with. I don't see how we can understand what anybody says unless we can understand a, a little bit about the grammar. Wherefore, I comfort you, encourage you, console you, and I, and I believe this to be God's Word. So I rule Paul out of this God Almighty, okay? S s you know, this... He, I'm not... Let, let me try to make this a little more... I, I hope I can make this a little more simple. Because I gave you new birth, you are being made a follower of me. That's a passive voice. My King James doesn't read it that way. I understand that, but that is what it says. Those of you who are, you know, uh, Greek scholars can argue that, uh, that the way that it's, it's translated is, is fine. That's acceptable. But I can't ignore the, the inference that it is God who's working in us, in you, and me to make us a follower of Him. Didn't he say that he, was, that he was working in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure? The reason that verse is hard to believe, I believe, is because when we, we look at our own lives, we can't imagine that. We, we look at the lives of, of, of other Christians, but especially ourselves, you know, and, and it just doesn't make any sense. Many don't think they're following Paul. They certainly don't think they're following God. I've told you that I get emails from folks who are panicked about the sin in their lives and the things that they've done wrong. You know, how can God be working in me? You know, I'm, I'm not going to question God. Uh, how, does, how does God work in you? Well, He works in you to will and to do His good pleasure. How? I don't know. I don't know how He does that. Uh, you know, whether it's a flat tire, uh, bankruptcy, you're out of work, you got cancer, you know, your wife left you, your husband left you. I, I don't know. What I believe is that God is working in you to will and to do of His good pleasure. That's what I believe. And I believe that because God said it. That you are becoming a follower of Him. Oh, but Steve, you know, why do I have to suffer? You know, you haven't suffered like I have. Dearly beloved, you all would be surprised to know how that I've suffered and how I do suffer. We all suffer. Because I don't think that there's any other solution. My Lord learned obedience from the things that He suffered. Okay? So do we. Without suffering, dearly beloved, there is no evidence of obedience do I really want to be a follower of His? Well, it looks like the text is telling me I don't have any choice. You talk about great comfort here. God is working in me, making me a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm more than willing to admit that I may be pushing the passive voice more than I should be. Or, But it's there. The passive voice is there. It didn't have to be in a passive voice. Would have made perfect sense if it were an active voice, but it isn't. It's also an imperative mood in the Greek, the mood of, of command. What's happening in your life, dearly beloved, is you are being made a follower of Christ. It's, it's in the imperative mood. It's imperative that you be made a follower of Christ. Not Paul. And it's interesting that the Holy Spirit says, I exhort you because you are being made a follower of me. Verse 17, For this cause I have sent unto you Timothy, uh, the text says Timotheus, I just, say, I just say Timothy. And again, I insist this is God speaking to us. This is God's Word. He's sending somebody to us. God is sending in your life, someone, okay, in the case of, of the Corinthians, it was Timothy. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, okay, 
who is my beloved son? Okay. In your life, it may be your church, it may be a friend, it may be something that you heard on YouTube it, uh, or the internet, uh, on TV, on the radio, I don't know. But I believe God sends someone into every one of His children's lives whom He loves as a, as a beloved son who reminds you of His ways. His ways, folks. His ways. I've heard people say, you know, Steve, I was listening to one of your videos and I, I don't know why I didn't click off. I wanted to. You know, you were saying some really stupid stuff, but I didn't. I listened anyway, and now I really understand God loves me. Or I really understand that God is truly sovereign. I really understand He's working in me to will and do His good pleasure. Or whatever thing. You know, that's, that's a miracle to me. God sent Timothy. I think application-wise, you and I can put any word in there that we want for Timothy. Now, you don't have to agree with me on that, but that's what I believe. God sent someone into your life to remind you of God's ways. You know, I was, I was influenced by a number of individuals early on in my Christian life, in my Christian walk. You know, I had to argue with many of them all the time. But I'll tell you, the Lord sent them into my life. They didn't come in by accident, okay? People who love the Lord, who spent time in this book, who spent time in His Word like I've, I've never seen, okay? People who put me to shame. And I was a young man. But the Lord used them to drive me to study. Lots of it. God is sending somebody into your life. I don't know who it is. You know, it may be, as I said, maybe somebody, somebody from a sermon, that you, someone you never met in person. I don't know. But God is comforting us here, okay? Encouraging us, consoling us by saying, I'm making you a follower of me because, why? Because I begat you. And it's for this cause, I'm going to send somebody into your life who is a beloved son. It's, I love the order of, the, of this, the progression of this. Someone who's my beloved son, who's one of my children, and he's not only that, he's faithful. He's faithful in the Lord. Okay, That is, God's going to have somebody come into your life who is his beloved son or daughter in the Lord to remind you of my ways. That is God's ways, not Paul's ways. God's ways, His ways. And dearly, dearly, beloved, is that saying God's going to have somebody come into your life uh, who is His beloved Son to remind you of Paul's ways? You know, we're now, so now I've got to go and do a ton of research on Paul's ways. I don't know what Paul's ways were. You know, I don't, he was persecuting Christians. So I, you know, I have a little bit of history. Uh, I know Paul was a very wealthy man, at least at one time, before his conversion on the road to Damascus. And in fact, one writer says that he had enough money to pay every working man's wage in the city of Jerusalem for over a year. That's a lot of money. You know, I, I don't know how many were working in Jerusalem, but that sounds like a lot of money to me. I don't know what his ways were. I do not know what Paul's ways were. I don't think we're looking at Paul's ways. I think we're looking at God's ways here. I don't think that's what the text is saying at all. This beloved son, I believe, look, I believe that there's a promise there God is going to do that to every one of His children whom He begat okay, some, at some time in your life. At some time in God's divine plan, decreed plan, when He wills it, He sends somebody, maybe more than one, who, who is a loved son, one for whom Christ died, into your life to remind you of His ways, not Paul's ways. I don't really care about Paul's ways. I didn't know Paul. And, and don't get me wrong, I, 
I praise God that in His Word I've been introduced to people like Paul, like Moses, like Daniel. You, you just go down the list. Interesting, you know, uh, people to see and to realize how God worked in their lives. But I don't think God is exhorting me to be reminded of Paul's ways, but His ways, God's ways. And if I know anything, it is that God's ways are not man's ways. You all are familiar with Ephesians chapter 2, uh, 8 and 9. Uh, you know, if you took Soul Winning 101, surely you, understand, you know those verses. You surely know. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Well, I want to read verse 10. You know, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works which God hath before ordained. That's the work of Christ, that we should walk in them. Christ's works, not our own. Ways, works, same thing. I pointed out to you in many a study that it is absolutely common absolutely common in the Christian community to misuse the word save or saved. You know, somehow the word saved means born again. If you were to meet the average Christian on, on the street or in church and he said to you, well, are you saved? What would he mean by that? Well, it depends on the person. But usually what he means by that is, have you been born again? Okay, and, and folks, those are different words. One is delivered, the other is begotten. And those are two totally different words. Okay, It ought to be obvious to any, any of us who understand the least bit of word meaning that you don't save things that are dead. Okay, So implicit. So, so intrinsic in the word saved is that whatever you're talking about is alive. If we're talking about humans or animals, you don't save dead dogs. What you do is you bury them. The word saved, delivered, differentiates itself from the biblical concept of, of birth, genomai is the word, or being born, you see born again in verse 1 there in Ephesians, and, and, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's your new birth. Now in verse 8, by grace are you saved, that is delivered, rescued, and you're rescued because in time past you lived in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. Verses 3 and 4. But God, He gave us life, and now we're rescued from that. So verse 8 is one that has been, I believe, grossly misused as a soul-winning verse to get you born again. You don't get anyone born again. Paul doesn't get the Corinthians born again. You don't born again yourself. It hasn't anything to do with that subject. This being rescued is not of works, lest any man should boast. It's grace, not works. Okay? That is, you're not rescued through your faithfulness by grace. You are rescued, you are saved, you are delivered by means of faithfulness, and that's Christ's faithfulness. That's not your faithfulness. That's not you. Not of yourself. It is a gift. We are His creation, His workmanship, having been in past time created in Christ Jesus upon, the word is epi in the Greek, look at it, upon, not, un, not unto, but upon good works, which God has before ordained, beforehand that we should walk in them. Them. Not what you define as good works. No. Christ's good works. 
And folks, that is fantastically different than the average approach to this verse. Now we go back to my ways here. The works of Christ, which are, which are in Christ, those are the works that we are reminded of. Someone's going to remind you of that. Sometimes we seem to fail to, re to, realize, to recognize the magnitude, folks, of what God's done. Those of you who are fathers and mothers, just as you would say to your own children, God has said to us, children, look, I love you. I love you so much. You'll never really fully comprehend how much I love you, no matter how great the debt I've already paid it. No matter what you do, I've already forgiven it. Everything is forgiven. Everything is paid for. And folks say to me, well, Steve, then I can do anything. I can just go out and live any way I want. And folks, that's the thing I've repeated here many and many a time over the years. Oh, but Steve, you're suggesting I can just go live any way I want. I can do anything I want to do and still go to heaven. And I tell you now, I'll tell you right now, okay? I already sin more than I want to right now, and I hope that you do too. I hope that you sin more than what you want to. And I'm going to heaven. I know I've been forgiven of all my sins. I know I don't want to sin. Dearly beloved, I do not believe that you're a new creation in Christ Jesus if your wants are not changed. The good works are the outcome, not the cause of salvation. The good works are the outcome, not the cause of salvation. The, the good, good works, works are, are the, the outcome, outcome not, not the cause, cause of salvation. salvation. The works that I do are the result of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ and it is upon good works. Not doing good works, but upon works that have already been for ordained, already been done. And those are nothing but the works of Jesus Christ. Those are the works that we walk in. That's what God has ordained, that we walk in the good works of Jesus Christ. Dearly beloved, your sins are forgiven. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. We saw in 1 John when we studied through that epistle, whosoever is born, begat, begotten of God, cannot sin for his seed abides in him. And he, he doesn't have any, any ability, no power to sin. The new man cannot sin. Those folks are wonderful truths. If, if Christ hadn't done those good works, we couldn't have been created in Christ Jesus. It's the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. That is the basis of our redemption and our being made new creations in Christ. Somebody, I don't know who, faithful to the Lord is going to remind you of my ways, God says. God's ways. They're not man's ways. You know, man's ways would be you go out, well, you do a good job, you'll get a pay increase. Any, anybody knows that the guy who works hardest is the guy that succeeds. You know, you got to put your nose to the grind, that kind of, you know, we all heard that growing up. We all know that. But God says, my ways are those which reside in Christ Jesus not my works. I am not blessed by doing works. I am blessed because God wants to bless me. He loves to bless me. In fact, He has. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. My ways are those which are in Christ. So rather than try to figure out what Paul's ways were, you know, and how he lived, and how he dedicated himself to the Lord, you know, that's, that's all good stuff. It's, all, it's great. I don't mean to demean that, folks, but I do not believe that's what the text says. The ways that I'm to examine, the ways that I'm being reminded of 
present tense, constantly being reminded of by someone, are Jesus Christ. He left heaven's glory. He loved me so much. He died in my place. To even think, to even suggest, you know, I don't think God loves me. I just, you know, I just had a heart attack. I just had cancer. I just lost my job. You know, my wife left me. Husband left me. Whatever. Kids won't, you know, do anything I tell them to do. God doesn't love me. Good heavens, folks. How does that compare to God's love for us that we constantly see in every verse of this epistle and every other one of the, of the entire book? How could you ever question God's love for you? Couldn't be more clear. The ways he's talking about are those in Christ, not in Paul, not in Timothy, not in yourself. as I teach everywhere in every church. This is what I teach, says the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit's not teaching that, He's not there. That's all He teaches, everywhere, in every church. we got some interesting stuff to look at at the end here. We'll pick up at verse 18 next time. Until then, rest in Him. I love you all. I truly do. This is Steve. Thanks for listening.